The period immediately preceding the U.S. Civil War is a period that's been relatively ignored in the study of U.S. history, and yet the dozen or so years between the war with Mexico and the Civil War was a dynamic period in American history, uh, socially, economically, politically, but also in international relations. Even though the nation was absorbed with questions of sectional issues, abolition, and the expansion of slavery, at the same time we were more and more willing to flex our muscle to support expanding economic interests. The little-remembered bombardment by the United States Navy of Greytown, which was in what was then the British Protectorate of the Mosquito Kingdom, was emblematic of our foreign policy of the era, and it served as a test case regarding the authority of the executive to utilize military force that still affects us today. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The town known as San Juan de Nicaragua has an interesting history, being caught up in various schemes of empires. Christopher Columbus was the first European known to have reached what is today called Nicaragua on his fourth voyage in 1502. The first Spanish settlements in the area were founded in 1524. In 1541, the Spanish established a garrison at the mouth of the San Juan River, which the Spanish called San Juan del Norte, or St. John of the North. Much of Nicaragua, including San Juan del Norte, gained independence from Spain with the Act of Independence in 1821, and Nicaragua became part of the Federal Republic of Central America. However, much of the eastern coast of what is today parts of Nicaragua and Honduras always resisted Spanish rule. Although the nature of their organization was unclear, the strip of coastline was called the Mosquito Kingdom, named after native peoples of the area. As a means of defense, the kingdom began a relationship with Britain in the 16th century. The area became a haven for anti-Spanish groups, notably English and French privateers and pirates who preyed on Spanish vessels, because, of course, all good stories involve pirates. While the Spanish and British continued to squabble over the area, the Mosquito Kingdom retained some semblance of autonomy through the 18th and into the 19th century. While the kingdom did not originally reach as far down as the settlement at San Juan del Norte, the town was occupied by the kingdom with the support of the British in 1842. In 1844, the British made the kingdom a protectorate, and in 1848 renamed San Juan del Norte Greytown, after Edward Grey, then governor of Jamaica. The reason for the British interest in the town at the port at the San Juan River was that it offered one of several proposed routes across Central America that could speed travel between the Atlantic and the Pacific. While the Isthmus of Panama was narrower than Nicaragua route, going up the San Juan River to Lake Nicaragua and then crossing the narrow Isthmus between the lake and the Pacific was farther north and offered a route that was largely already navigable water. The economic value of such a route was magnified when, in January of 1848, gold was discovered in California, leading to a gold rush and masses of people seeking the fastest route from the U.S. East Coast to the West. The U.S. and Britain signed a treaty in 1850 called the clayton bulwer Treaty that was intended to prevent conflict between the two over the territories of Central America and any proposed canal across Central America, although the two squabbled over the terms of the treaty. One of the people who recognized economic opportunity in a route across Nicaragua was American railroad and shipping magnate Cornelius Vanderbilt. Born in New York in 1794, Vanderbilt had begun his career ferrying freight between Staten Island and Manhattan. By the 1840s, Vanderbilt had made a fortune operating steamboats along the Hudson River and boats and railroads around the Boston and Long Island Sound that connected northern textile mills to southern cotton producers, as well as, among other things, operating the Staten Island Ferry. By 1850, Cornelius Vanderbilt was one of the wealthiest people in the world and one of the most famous in America when he set his sights on the Nicaragua route. Vanderbilt proposed a canal across Nicaragua, although he never found enough investment to build it. But he did obtain an exclusive contract with Nicaragua to operate a route that used steamboats to travel up the San Juan River and across Lake Nicaragua and then used stagecoaches to take the passengers across the Isthmus to the Pacific port of San Juan del Sur. Vanderbilt created the Accessory Transit Company to operate the route. Vanderbilt then operated steamships between San Juan del Sur and California and on the first part of the route from New Orleans to San Juan del Norte. The passengers and facilities caused a boom in Greytown, which grew tremendously. A report in 1852 described Greytown as a small place, probably of 500 inhabitants, situated on a level green spot between the river and a small but beautiful freshwater lake. Much of the town had been improved by Americans, and the town was said to resemble a California settlement with hotels with names like the United States Hotel and the American. 
But Greytown was part of the dispute between the United States and Great Britain over the meaning of the clayton bulwer Treaty. The U.S. asserted that the treaty meant that Britain was supposed to vacate the Mosquito Coast, while the British interpreted the treaty to mean that they merely could not expand the protectorate. The local government, supported by the British Navy, attempted to collect docking and loading fees in Greytown. Vanderbilt insisted that he was not subject to such fees, his contract being with Nicaragua and not the Mosquito Kingdom. In 1851, a British ship fired upon the steamer Prometheus with Vanderbilt on board in order to compel it to pay the fees. The U.S. sent two Navy sloops to the area, and the British apologized. But the question of who really controlled the port and things like docking fees remained unsettled, and there was continued conflict between local authorities and Vanderbilt's accessory transit company. And the international situation became even more confusing when the city essentially declared itself an independent city, no longer beholding to the Mosquito Kingdom. In 1853, riots in the city damaged company property. But events came to a head in May of 1854. In 1853, Solon Borland, a former soldier and U.S. Senator, was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Nicaragua. His tenure was controversial. Notably, he opined that the British had violated the terms of the clayton bulwer Treaty by not evacuating the Mosquito Kingdom, and thus advocated conflict with Britain. He also stirred controversy by suggesting that Nicaragua should join the United States, saying that it was his greatest ambition to see Nicaragua forming a bright star in the flag of the United States. In May, Borland was in Greytown when an American captain of a merchant vessel was accused of murder, having shot a man in a dispute. When local authorities came to arrest the captain, Borland held them off with a pistol. Now, it might be that Borland was defending the captain because he thought him innocent. Some stories say that he saw the dispute that occurred, but Borland understood the precedent involved. If local authorities were allowed to arrest this U.S. citizen, then that established their authority and would allow them to do things like charge docking fees. When he got in their way, the crowd tried to arrest Borland, and in the ensuing melee, he was hit in the face with a thrown bottle. Outraged, he impressed some U.S. visitors in the town into a sort of militia that was charged with protecting U.S. property, and then hopped a ship back to the United States to seek a strong response from the U.S. government. In June, Secretary of the Navy James Dobbin issued instructions to Navy Commander George Hollins in command of the sloop of war USS Cyane, in pursuance of the wishes of the President. Dobbin noted that the property of the American citizens interested in the accessory transit company, it is said, had been unlawfully detained by persons residing in Greytown, and stated that apprehension is felt that further outrages will be committed. Dobbin's instructions to Hollins were, Now it is very desirable that these people should be taught that the United States will not tolerate these outrages, and that they have the power and the determination to check them. It is, however, very much to be hoped that you can affect the purposes of your visit without a resort to violence and the destruction of property and loss of life. Cyane was a powerful warship, 132 foot 4 inches long with a beam of 26 foot 3 inches. Cyane carried 18 32 pounder guns and four 24 pounder guns. The Cyane had destroyed or captured more than 30 vessels in the war with Mexico, where the ship had played a significant role in the campaign in the far west. Hollins had served with Stephen Decatur in the War of 1812 and then in the War with Algeria in 1815. Cyane arrived in Greytown on July 11th. A witness described the events to the New York Times. Captain Hollins made demands of the former authorities and the people for damages from property stolen from the transit company, and also an apology from the town and the people of the town for having insulted the United States in the person of Minister Boland, and issued a proclamation that if within 24 hours from the time the demand was made they did not come forth and give satisfaction, he would proceed to bombard the town. The proclamation would seem to be a rather loose interpretation of the Secretary's orders, which expressed the hope that they could achieve their results without resorting to violence. When Hollins got no response, at 9 a.m. on July 13th, he fired 130 cannon shot and shell into the town, and then dispatched a party of Marines to set fire to what was left reducing the entire town to ashes. However, because of his warning, the people had evacuated the town and no lives were lost. There was a British ship, HMS Bermuda, moored at the port, commanded by Lieutenant W.D. Jolly at the time, but his ship, a schooner of just three guns, was, as he explained, so totally inadequate against the Cyane that it could only enter a protest. The incident was published in European papers and earned general condemnation. However, in his address to Congress in December, President Pierce defended the action. Pierce argued that the people who had taken control of the town were not a recognized state and were acting as plunderers akin to pirates. 
Moreover, he argued that they were likely to cause more mischief. He said, not standing before the world in the attitude of an organized political society, being neither competent to exercise the rights nor to discharge the obligations of a government, it was in fact a marauding establishment, too dangerous to be disregarded and too guilty to pass unpunished, and yet incapable of being treated in any other way than as a piratical resort of outlaws or a camp of savages depredating on immigrant trains or caravans and the frontier settlements of civilized states. The bombardment was the result of their own action, he explained. No extreme act would have been requisite had not the people themselves, by their extraordinary conduct in the affair, frustrated all the possible mild measures for obtaining satisfaction. Britain, of course, disagreed with Pierce's description, but embroiled in the Crimean War, they could ill afford to go to war with the United States, and British and European condemnation went largely unanswered. The action really represented U.S. foreign policy at the time. We were much more willing to give a muscular response in defense of economic interests, but we avoided war with European powers. Greytown was quickly rebuilt and was again embroiled in conflict in 1855 when William Walker, one of the infamous filibusters, Americans who engaged in private military actions, took over Greytown and proclaimed himself president of Nicaragua, sparking a civil war. Eventually, political instability in Nicaragua shifted attention to the Panama trans-isthmus route, and the Nicaraguan passage was abandoned. It's difficult to say how different history would have been had a canal been built via Nicaragua rather than Panama. While the naval bombardment of Greytown seems to be a trivial and forgettable event, it had a significant impact on U.S. policy. There was a, a U.S. citizen by the name of Calvin Durand who sued Commodore Hollins over damages to his property in Greytown. The suit raised important questions about the president's authority over the use of the military, as many in Congress argued that, as the Constitution grants the power to declare war solely to Congress, only Congress could authorize military force. The district court decision in the case of Durant versus Hollins decided that the president has broad authority to use the military to defend U.S. citizens and U.S. interests because those questions can arise quickly and must be dealt with promptly and cannot wait for the action of Congress. That became a central piece in the law that surrounds the authority of the executive to utilize the military and was used, for example, to justify U.S. incursions into Cambodia during the Vietnam conflict and as recently as 2014 to justify actions against the Islamic State, 160 years after the naval action that is otherwise forgotten history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.